we're still left with the question, what is life and how did life get started? So my response to that, which some of them found quite um, unsatisfying, is that that's not as precise a question as you think, right? I mean, in some sense, trying to draw the line between animate and inanimate and trying to have a very precise definition ultimately amounts to words, right? It's a continuum from, from inanimate to animate. And once we have the molecular Darwinism in place, rolling forward, life just emerges in that continuum. So my question to you, is that a reasonable way of describing I, it? I think it is. Um, I think that there's a too great a tendency in the human mind to try to draw lines and to try to, where there, where there is a spectrum. I mean, sometimes there really is a line, but in other cases there isn't. And we should not insist that there has to be a line. Well, in the case of life, I suppose you could sort of see a kind of line when the first self-replicating entity came into existence, because that was the moment when natural selection and hence Darwinian evolution could start. You can't get natural selection unless you've got something equivalent to a gene. So the first gene, which would not have been DNA, by the way, but the, f the first gene um, would be a kind of watershed event, I suppose. But I agree with you, we, we don't want to get too hung up on the questions of definition, which dim like a definition of life, as opposed to non-life, right. which demand a particular moment at which life came into existence. And when you say first gene, in that context, can I think of it as the first molecule that discovers this capacity for making copies of itself, period? Yes, making copies of itself, and that would include making copies of errors in itself. Right. Um, so that there, there has to be variety in the population of these replicating entities. The reason I say it wouldn't have been DNA is that DNA has been described as a high-tech replicator that requires a rather complicated infrastructure of biochemistry in order to, to do its replication. So people in the field agree that the first replicator would not have been DNA. It would have been something else that had the property of self-replication, probably much less efficient at it than DNA. And DNA would have been a late usurper of that role. It could have been RNA. And do you think it was RNA? Is I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's a current fashionable idea. That, and the reason it's fashionable is that, um, as you know, there's a kind of divide in, in biochemistry between the protein, which acts as enzyme, and, and the, the variety of enzymes, which is the key to everything that goes on in, in, in life. The fact that the three-dimensional form of a protein molecule, when it coils up into a sort of knot, which gives it its enzymatic properties, and that is determined by the um, one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, which in turn is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of uh, DNA. Um, so there's this double act between DNA and protein. Uh, D DNA is not an enzyme, it's an excellent replicator. Protein is an excellent enzyme, but cannot replicate. Uh, RNA is kind of moderate at both. So uh, if, if, R if it started off with RNA, that could have done both the enzyme role, because N RNA is a kind of rather bad enzyme. Right. and a kind of rather bad replicator, but it can do both roles. And so the idea is then that DNA would have come in and usurped the replication role, and protein then came in and usurped the enzyme role. So how, how big, how big a molecule do you imagine this first replicator would be? I suppose it would be quite small, the, the, the first one. Yeah. Right, I mean... Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is an, an active field of... Well, I suppose research, but very speculative research. Right. Because, you know, you'll see people making the argument that whatever molecule you put forward as the first one, if it has some degree of complexity associated with it, you can then ask yourself, you know, what are the odds yeah. that that molecule will yeah. form? And when that number is necessarily quite small, some people see a tension 
with the naturalness of the process yeah. and the yeah. unlikelihood that it would happen. So how, it, how do you answer that? It, well, it, it, it is a field where, where the, there, there is no answer yet, and, and people are not, are not confident of, of it. Um, there, are, there are various problems with the so-called uh, Catch-22 um, that, you, that, 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 that you can't get um, DNA without protein and vice versa. Right. Um, there, are, uh, there are other problems with it. Um, some people have favored what they call a hypercycle, where um, there are various stages in, the, in, a, in, a, in a chain, and each stage gives rise to the next. So that is no one molecule is the, is the key replicator. The entire hypercycle um, is, is the key, is the, is the replicator. Um, but it's, it's not a field which has been solved. It's not a question which has been answered. Um, it is still conceivable that the origin of life, the origin of the self replication, the origin of uh, natural selection, was a stupendously improbable event. Right. Uh, and th the corollary of that would be that there's no other life in the universe. I mean, or put it the other way, if you want to believe that there is only one life form in the universe, which you're entitled to do, um, then it, a corollary of that is that the origin of life on this planet must have been a, a fantastically improbable event, so much so that any theory we come up with has got to be a very implausible theory. Right. Because if it were plausible, <laughs> there would be life all over the universe, yes. which I suspect there probably is. I'm just saying that if you want to believe that life only arose once, then what you're looking for in a theory of the origin of life is not a plausible theory such as you could replicate in a chemistry lab. So, I mean, so there is a lot of evidence that all life on Earth comes from a common single-celled ancestor. Yes, the, ev the evidence for that is, is that the DNA code is all but universally the same in every living form that's ever been examined. And the odds of that coming about convergently is extremely low. So I think just about everybody is convinced that every single life form, at least those that have been looked at, de descends from a common ancestor. It's because it's got the same machine code at its base. There now, are does, that, does that strike you as, as a puzzle or just something that we need no, to No, I accept? don't think it's a puzzle. I mean, it, it, it could be that more than one life form arose originally. And we just don't see and, them. And, we don't, and, and as Darwin said originally, Darwin said um, one of them ate up all the others. Right. So that, that, that's a possibility. Paul Davies, your physics colleague, um, thinks it's worth looking to see if there are other life forms. They, just, they may be around on Earth, but never been, been found. Um, I, I liken that to the looking for your keys under the lamppost. And when somebody lost his keys, and so he's looking under, under the lamppost for the keys. And somebody else asks him, why are you looking under the lamppost? Is that where you lo lost your keys? No, but that's where the light is. Right. So, um, uh, if we're asking the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? We can't go elsewhere in the universe yet. It's very difficult to. Well, the, the, so let's look. But the here. universe can come to us, and some have suggested that maybe the origin, you know, life in some yes. form may have come here on a, you know, um, on a meteor or got yes. pummeled off of yes. Mars. Well, that, that's not so implausible as it, it was once thought to be. Yeah. Um, so the theory of panspermia. Um, invented by a Swedish, um, a Swedish biologist called Arrhenius uh, yeah, about a century ago now. Um, and it was espoused by Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, very distinguished astronomer, but he, he kind of went adrift a bit on, on evolution anyway. Um, directed panspermia is a, is a more far-fetched idea, which was actually favored, I think, a bit tongue-in-cheek you mean that actually someone sent it yes. here to, I mean, to see life? Uh, Francis Crick, the, 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 the great um, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, um, together with Leslie Orgel, suggested that, um, we, that our planet could have been deliberately seeded by an alien civilization. I, I think it was a joke. I mean, I, I mean they, they, they sort of presented it as though it was a serious theory. But, but, right. Um, um, so, so when you consider the, the rich spectrum of life on Earth that all, say, arose from this singular starting point. Do you find that the, the range is sensible relative to the environment that life 
found itself trying to adapt to, or do you find it strange that we don't have you know, beings with you know, nine eyes or eyes that work under completely different principles or I don't know, some being that would be sensitive to gravitational waves. Yes. And, you know. now that, I'm very fascinated by that kind of question. Um, and you can get a long way by looking around the animal kingdom and, and, and asking how many times different things have evolved. And you can work out how many times they've evolved because you can work out what the tree of life actually is. You, you know which animals are close relations of, of, of which. So we know, for example, that there are, I think it's nine different principles of eyes, different, really? different ways of doing, doing the optics. And that eyes have evolved independently several dozen times. One estimate is, is more than 40 times. Really? Um, so eyes actually evolve with great ease, with great frequency. Um, and they're got, all sensitive to the same part of the spectrum because uh, of the not sun? Not exactly the same, but it's overlapping. Right. Uh, insect eyes move towards the ultraviolet, for example. Um, but it, it's, it's nice to think that all the ways of making an eye that physicists have thought of have been thought of by evolution um, in, in rather interesting ways. I mean, the, com the compound eye works in a totally different way from the camera eye, which is what, which is what we have. There are mollusks which have a, a, a reflector eye, a, 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 a parabolic reflector. You mean like a radio dish out there? Yes, really? yes. But, but optical. Wow. Uh, so... Um, that there are scallops that have that. Have that. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of compound eye, lots of different kinds of camera eye. Um, and they've evolved independently. Other things like, say, um, echolocation, navigating by sonar, by, by sound waves, that's evolved four times independently uh, in bats, whales, and two different families of birds, cave-dwelling birds, in, independently. So that's rather more reluctant to evolve, but nevertheless right. it has evolved more than once. Some things have evolved only once, and so you feel they're improbable things. Right. Mm. So, so in trying to understand the likelihood or not of the emergence of life, and therefore to try to gain some insight into the question that you made reference to, whether we're alone or there's other life out there in the universe, you know, sometimes people write down this, um, this Drake equation, which I, every time I see it, I always feel like it's, it's misrepresenting the situation because it's not so much an equation describing the actual likelihood of the arising of life. It's more a way of uh, encapsulating our ignorance of yeah. the whole variety of qualities of the universe mm -hmm. that we really don't have any insight into. So any number that comes out of it is really just totally dependent on the ignorance that we have regarding the numbers that go into it. But, but be that as it may, when when you think about that life may have just started once on this planet, does that diminish your expectation that the search for extraterrestrial life will be successful? Well, we can't escape from the fact that it did arise on this planet. I mean, yeah. That's a, it's a, it's, it's, so it's a sample it's size a, of one, it's, and it's, what yes. do you do with that? I would love another one. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, 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 um, because we just don't know, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by the question how much of what we know about this, this form of life yeah. had to be so, because there's only one way for it to be. For example, does there have to be a, something like a gene? I think the answer is yes. Does it have to be... I mean, just because you need something to, care, to, 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 to do propagate double, yes, the information. Yes. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional Array does it have to be digital? Right. I think it probably has to be digital. Does digital it, because otherwise errors would too creep much, into too, too much error. Yes. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional string of data, which DNA is? And I don't think that's clear. I, mean, I could imagine a two-dimensional matrix, right, um, which could be read, not three-dimensional, because you can't get inside the um, right the, the three-dimensional blob. Um, so that's kind of question. Does there have to be sex? Would you expect to get eyes? I, I, I bet you'd get eyes, um, because, because eyes have happened so many times here. But presumably if it was a star that emitted strongly in a completely different part of the spectrum, then that's maybe sensitivity sure. there yes. or something of that sort. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, so it leads to, to the question then. Um, if you had your choice, 
in some sense, as to what we would find if we encountered life in another world, would you want it to be the same in order that you would have a unified theory of life in some sense, or would you rather it be different so that now you just see this grand spectrum of possibility with us just being one of many? I'd be delighted by either. I mean, if, right. it, if, it, if, it, were, if it were too similar, if for, <clears throat> if, for example, you found life on Mars and it was DNA-based and the DNA code was the same, Right, then, then it's I, probably the same. Then it's got to be contamination. Right. Um, because we, kn we know that... So we mean we're Martians. It could have come from there. It and could have come from right. there. It, right. But we, we know that a lot of meteorites have come from, from Mars. So right. That, so, but if, it's, um, if it were DNA but a different DNA code, that would be rivetingly exciting. Right. If it were not DNA but something like... You know, another... Um, uh, polymer, um, gosh, it would be fascinating, it would yeah. be amazing. Um, I think it would be the most exciting discovery ever, actually, to find, to find something like, like that. I, I mean, we, we, as you say, we've got a sample of one. L life on this planet is uniform at the biochemical level. Even, even great big creatures like us, we do our biochemistry quite largely using tricks that were discovered by primordial bacteria, and, yep. they, and many of them are in us doing the same trick. We've simply commandeered them. Yeah, no, it'd be hugely so, exciting. Almost exciting as string theory or something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll come on to that. Yeah. But um, so, 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 you know, as we enter an age when we can begin to actually tinker with the actual structure of life, say CRISPR, Cas9, um, do you imagine that we'll be able to gain some insight into these questions in the laboratory as opposed to... I think, yes, to I mean, I, I would, I, whenever I meet a biochemist, I always ask them, can you imagine an alternative biochemistry? Could yeah. you construct an alternative biochemistry? Right. Or if you can't construct it, at least Im imagine it. Um, does it have to be carbon-based, for example? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Would you agree with that? Or well, I mean, carbon is certainly the natural go-to species if I didn't know anything about life and you gave me a list of criterion that you want to have a very active molecule, you want it to be able to bond with all sorts of other molecules in the environment, you want it to be uh, uh, a, a species that's commonplace, so that it's not a rare species that we deal with. But um, there are other pretty active species too. Well, um, silicon is, is mentioned yeah, right, as, for as an element which, which could, could possibly do the same job. Right. Um, but um, I asked Harry Croto, the famous organic yeah, sure, chemist, yeah. and he, he's confident it'll be... That, that it had to be carbon-based. Uh, yeah, it had to be carbon-based. But that leaves a lot of freedom, nevertheless. I mean, even, even within carbon, with, even within organic chemistry, an enormous freedom to, to divert, devise alternative biochemistries. Right. Now, do you, do you think that there will come a point when we just can create life from scratch in the laboratory? I mean, is that in our future? Yes. Uh, I think so, yes. I mean, well, Craig Venter has already created... Well, sort of. ...replica, I mean, uh, yeah. just sort of re re reproduced the same thing. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so... so I mean, do you want to say what Craig has done just to... Uh, well, um, he, he has re recreated um, a particular bacterium from scratch. Um, but it's, it is just, a, just one that already existed. Right. Well, if you can do that then you could theoretically create one that doesn't exist already. Uh, and and um, uh, so, we, and from that I suppose you could e might even go ahead, go on to multicellular right. life. And so, you know, does, does this, I mean, obviously this is an exciting possibility. Does it scare you? It excites me more than it scares me. Um, I, I, I'm just fascinated by it and by the, the, the possibilities. So I'm, uh, I do think we have to exercise a precautionary principle. And how, do you, how, do, how would you imagine doing that? As, do you know Sidney Brenner, a great molecular biologist? Uh, not personally, but yeah. Keep the lid on your Petri dish well screwed down, he said. 